Greetings, everyone, and welcome to episode 68 of Teaching Tales, the podcast completely devoted to sharing stories from the world of education. I am Brent Coley, your host, an elementary school principal in beautiful and currently very warm Southern California. And joining me today, one of one of the, well, I've had, this is now the second member of my family. Joining me today is my amazing daughter, Megan. Hi, Megan. Hi. How are you? Good. How are good, you? Good, good, good. So, so we had my dad back on for anyone listening who was with us from the beginning. I think my dad was episode six, if I can remember. And now we're 68 and I've got Megan, my daughter. So, this is the point in the in the show where I typically have the guest introduce himself or herself. So Megan, I know how old how old are you, Megan? 18 years old. 18 years old and in a couple of days where are you headed off to? San Diego for Point Loma Nazarene University. Yes. So for anyone listening, uh, Megan is getting ready to head off to college. We are sitting in her room right now uh, recording an episode of the podcast. And in three days, we're going to pack up the car and take her about an hour and a half south to beautiful San Diego. Uh, she's going to be heading off to college. And I have wanted to have Megan on the podcast for had the idea, I want to say a couple of years ago, and I was just reminded I was listening to Teaching Keating, uh, the amazing epi- uh, podcast by Weston and Molly Kieschnick, uh, and they had their kids on the broadcast. They were talking about uh, opening scenes to movies and how it relates to back to school, and they asked their children what they were expecting, what they were looking forward to as they went back to school. And as I was listening, it reminded me of my desire to have Megan on because I have a unique thing that I want to talk to Megan about. So I think, and I think a lot of you listening will will um, agree with me that so often we as teachers, as educators, administrators, whatever our role in education is, we read books, we go to professional development events, we do we do conferences, and we are constantly seeking, if you're listening to this podcast, it's because you want to better yourself. We're constantly seeking to get better. How can we become a better teacher, a better leader, a better administrator? But I think too often we fail to really seek the advice and the guidance and the wisdom of our customers, our students. So what I've done is I want Megan... I gave Megan a couple questions last night. I kind of typed up some questions. I want to get Megan's perspective on uh, education because she has now, she is a high school graduate getting ready to head off to college. So she has completed K-12 education. So she's had a whole bunch of teachers and I want to get her perspective because again, I think the student's perspective, if we're not asking students what is working, what is not working, I think we're missing the boat on uh, on a perspective on on an area of, of of on a voice that we have got to be listening to. So I gave questions to Megan, kind of asking her about her schooling, some advice that she would give last night. I have not seen; she has not told me what she is going to say, which is good. I wanted it to be kind of organic. So, Megan, let's jump right in. Uh, so, Megan, when you You've, like I said, you've completed your high school career, your elementary K-12 education mm-hmm. is done. When you think back on all of your years in school, what do you remember? What are some of your favorite memories? Well, I think I'll go ahead and like divide it between elementary, middle school, and high school. Perfect. So for elementary school, I was a part of the school plays at Lisa J. Mills Elementary School that I remember vividly. I made a lot of friends during those productions and I had a lot of fun realizing how much I loved music. So those stand out in my mind. We also had handball tournaments that I remember being a part of that were just really fun that stick out in my mind, which are outside of the classroom, but I still remember them. And then inside of the classroom, we had a lot of art projects that I can remember. I can't give you specifics, but I just remember that I appreciated the emphasis in arts that I got to do and the creativity that I got to show. And then in middle school, I was really 
happy and excited to be a part of the web program my eighth grade year to help with sixth graders when can they you, were coming in. Can you explain what web, like oh, yeah. what, what does web stand for? What is that? So web is a program full of eighth graders helping sixth graders become accustomed to um, middle school and all of the changes. Doesn't web like where everyone belongs? Where everybody belongs. Where everybody yes. belongs. So it focuses on unity and everybody feeling like the transition from fifth grade to sixth grade isn't as scary as it needs to be. So I remember being able to be among leaders around me and great instructors helping new sixth graders was a really great experience. And then I had a great English teacher my eighth grade year, Dr. Spivey, who actually retired after he was finished teaching me and my fellow eighth graders. And I'm incredibly grateful that I was a part of his last class because he set me up for amazing accomplishments in high school. He prepared me for long essays, lots of different research papers, and he helped me to realize how much I loved writing and that it was more than just something that interested me, but something I might want to do after high school. And then in high school, I was very fortunate to be a part of the varsity swim team and compete for my school, where I have so many amazing memories and laughs and friends and teammates and coaches. They totally stand out in my mind. I was also able to be a captain for two years, which I'm grateful for, to have become more of a leader and be able to be the best leader that I could be. Apart from web, it furthered my leadership skills. And then I was also a part of choir and choir was another place for me to make tons of memories and friends and learn how much I loved music. Like I said about the school plays and we went to amazing places like New Orleans and Canada where I was able to sing for lots of different people and realize how much I love music. And then I also in my English classes just loved reading the books that we were supposed to read because I just love books. You're a reader. <laughs> So we read Lord of the Flies and uh, The Book Thief. Those two stand out in my mind the most. The Book Thief's actually now my favorite book, and I wouldn't have known that because I probably wouldn't have read it if I wasn't reading it with Mr. Hafer. Shout out to Mr. Hafer. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, those are some of my favorite memories and things I was a part of. Awesome. And, again, I'm not surprised, but for so many of the things you said, you, you didn't mention fractions. I did not. You, you, <laughs> you, did, you didn't mention that. You mentioned handball tournaments mm -hmm. and, and art projects and the plays that you got to do. So um, it's not all about the academics. Mm -hmm. So that's important, but it's not all about that. So, so the second thing is kind of you talked about your memories. But if I, if I now asked you... To think back, again, K-12, and I'm not sure how you're going to answer this if you divided it up, but think back to your favorite teachers. And because I think if we ask anybody listening, like, who is your favorite teacher? I think every one of us can identify at least, I hope, at least mm -hmm. one favorite teacher, probably more than one. And my question to you is, who who were those teachers? But more importantly, why were they your favorites? Mm -hmm. What what was it that they did that make them, it could be years ago, still stand out in your mind as your favorites? Mm -hmm. I have a lot of favorite teachers, and I think that if I really thought hard enough, I could come up with a special thing for each teacher. But I just thought of who popped up in my mind first and like went from youngest to oldest. Okay. So I first have uh, Mrs. Ackley, who was my fourth grade teacher. Um, what really stands out first when I think of her is how she comforted me when I was the new kid mm -hmm. at um, Lisa J. Mills because I came from Monta Vista to Lisa J. Mills, where it's two schools in our area. I had to do like a, a switch and I was really nervous because I only knew one other uh, girl who was one of my close friends, but only one other person. And I was really nervous about who this new teacher was going to be. And I remember she had me come down, I think, a day or two before the first day of school and meet her and see the classroom, which was really great for my spatial mind to, like, see things mm -hmm. and meet her. She also had a large emphasis on music and everything that we did. It was an arts-based school, but she just had a passion for music that she infused in her teaching and always had, like, she had breaks for us to have that would have to do with, like, listening to a song or, like, singing something, and I just remember how much I loved that. She also had a really great classroom. She decorated it with all of our artwork and lots of different like posters from her travels too. And 
she had really great projects too. We did like this gold rush project where we were like in groups of four and we were like pretending like we were traveling in covered wagons on our way to gold. And if we answered questions correctly about what we'd learned earlier that day about the gold rush, we'd be closer to getting the gold on this interactive map she made. So that was, that was really fun. And then Mrs. Beckley was my seventh grade language arts and science teacher. And she's amazing. She's amazing. I love her very much. <laughs> and that will bring me to my first thing I remember and still love about her is that she was more than just a teacher for me. Uh, she was kind of a, a spiritual leader for me in that time of my life, which I know is not expected of every teacher that you have. So this was very special. Uh, she hosted um, or she allowed the coordinators of the student venture in our area to come and have our her, their club in her classroom. So she made an environment for us to be able to hear the word and be together with other students who wanted to hear the word, which was great. And I still, I was able to see her a few weeks ago because I wanted to say goodbye before I left and it was great to talk with her and she's still very invested in my life, mm -hmm. which is great. She's very relatable and approachable, I remember that. I was never afraid to ask her questions if I needed help with anything. I could tell that she actually loved and she still actually loves to teach and she really cares about her students. She wants them to succeed. And overall, she's just a caring and loving how, person. How, how could you tell that she... That she cared? Yeah. She, Is there anything you can put your finger on? She always maintained eye contact. I know that that's kind of a small thing, but I don't think people maintain eye contact as much as they, they should or maybe it feels uncomfortable. And that's something small, but I just remember that when I, I can picture her face, she was always looking right at me. I could tell that she was intent with the way that she was listening. She was a very good listener and she just would make the time to talk. Like I said, she was approachable. Like she would make the time to talk to you if you asked her or if she could, she could tell if you needed to talk to. Mm. And then I had a great English teacher for um, 10th grade. He was also my cinema's literature teacher my senior year, which I really appreciated both of those classes, Mr. Hafer, he had a genuine or has a genuine love for both writing and movies. And that's why he taught both uh, English and uh, movie kind of enthusiast and movie um, like, I don't really know how to describe it, but we, we watch movies and we analyze them from a literary point of view. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated like that new look on movies, but he, he knew how to have fun. He actually just, he retired. So he knows how to have fun, but he doesn't have his classroom anymore. <laughs> he knew how to have fun between lessons. He knew how to have fun in lessons. And he was a great communicator. He knew how to have good conversations with students that weren't all, weren't all just about the academics. He knew how to ask about how our days were without it being weird or seeming ingenuine. Like he knew... He just knew how to talk to his students, and I appreciated that. He felt like he was on the our level, mm -hmm. and I just loved how much he loved movies. I could quote movies with him. He would quote them to me, and I would know what he was talking about, and that was pretty great. <laughs> and then I'll lump together my last few. First, I have Mrs. Garnett. She was my math teacher freshman through junior year, and I greatly appreciate amazing her help. Amazing teacher. Yes, she's an amazing teacher in so many ways, but one of them is just the way that she can explain math and complex math, not easy math. Because I, I took some Common Core classes with her, Common Core math. So they, they weren't called pre-calculus, calculus, and trigonometry, but that was the kind of stuff we were doing. It was all kind of lumped together, and it certainly wasn't easy for me. I had to work hard to understand a lot of it, but I had the drive to want to understand it, and she helped me to stay motivated and she really explained things very 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 well and she she just took the time to explain things more than once even though it was tedious to explain all of that complex math and i just appreciate having her for three years straight and just yeah it was great to be in her classroom that was a blessing and then i'll like i said i'll lump the last few it's my eighth grade teacher i already talked about dr spivey my ninth grade English teacher, Mrs. Myers, and my junior year English teacher, Mr. Olson, because they all were very different, but they all had, they all shared a passion for writing that made me realize how much I love to write and how it's not just something that kind of interested me. Like I knew I've loved books all my life, but I also 
now because of them I'm able to realize that I might want to write a book or I might want to really pursue writing and not just enjoy it. They all really helped me to believe in myself too and believe that my love for writing can be more than just a hobby. Mm. They all helped me to realize that I had a gift and that I could write and that I I was doing well in their classes and they let me know that, which I appreciated. And I loved reading different books with all of them too. I can't name them all now, but I just remember that I really, really enjoyed all of their classes and they were all they were all unique in their own ways, but they all shared that passion for writing that they kind of helped me realize too. So as I'm mentally taking notes from what you just said, the characteristics, the, the, the common things that you described, passion. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, multiple, your t- the teachers who had passion for what they do for their students are what really stuck out to you. Now, those last teachers, the English ones, the the ones who had a passion for writing, tell people who are listening right now, what are you going to study in college? (laughs) I'm studying writing. It's a writing major. So it kind of branches over lots of different kinds of writing, uh, technical as well as like poetry and creative and um, marketing, editing, magazine, all, all that kind of stuff because I'm trying to still figure out exactly what it is that I want to write about, what kind of job. I want to have when it comes to a writing career. So, yes. So never. So the the moral of that that I'm take is is for anyone listening right now. When you have passion, if you're if you're a classroom teacher, uh, or a leader or a site leader for that for that matter, that passion. Had just simply having passion and a love for what you're teaching, you never know exactly what that is going to do. Because mm-hmm. I'm sitting across from my daughter who has a gift she has a gift for that but the passion that the teachers that she's had has propelled her and now outside of high school she is going to continue to pursue that the other things that you said you said uh they cared Mm -hmm. i think you said mrs ackley she took time out of her day to to welcome you to make you feel safe Mm -hmm. mrs beckley you said the same type of thing she she welcomed you in and Gosh, I love what you said about the eye contact. Yeah. Uh, that that gave me goosebumps. And wow, what for anyone listening from myself, what a great reminder that she looked at you when she spoke mm-hmm. and that communicated to you, I'm present. I am I am yes. I am here for you. I'm listening. It's not you're not bothering me. Mm-hmm. So boy, if if I take nothing else out of this conversation, which is not true. I'm going to take a whole bunch (laughs) from this conversation. But if you take nothing else, anyone listening, gosh, eye contact, eye contact. So once again, you, you didn't, you didn't mention, you mentioned writing, but you didn't mention specifics about a lot of things that you, that, that made those teachers your favorite were Mm -hmm. the passion, the caring, the investment in your life. So again, if you're taking notes at home on, well, I want to be somebody's favorite teacher, Here's what Megan says, and I think there's a whole bunch of people out there who would agree. So, Megan, for that teacher who is listening, maybe it's somebody who is student teaching right now and getting ready to start uh, his or her career, or someone who's already in the field, what advice would you give to teachers in terms of being a great teacher? Because we all want to be great at what we do, but as I said at the top of the show, I think too often we fail to ask the students, you tell me, what what do I need to do to be great? What What's, what's your advice? Well, these are just, just me. Mm-hmm. But I think that it's very important to always verbally ask after you have um, explained something if anyone has questions because I know that sometimes there are some really shy kids that are just waiting for the opportunity to ask a question, they raise their hand because they're afraid to ask otherwise. And I think that it's really important because sometimes if there isn't clarification for something and from the teacher itself, they're not gonna go ask for it in another context. They're not always gonna put the extra effort to figure out what it is they need to understand after class or have the courage to ask their peers. I just know for me sometimes in certain environments, and it doesn't have anything to do with the teacher, it might even just be the different students that are around me. I'm not always confident enough to raise my hand yep. and ask. So I think it's very important that teachers make make it clear that 
you can ask questions and say, does anyone have any questions? And like sometimes just saying that is enough first, a lot of people to raise mm-hmm. their hands and then a good discussion to follow. And if it's not raising the hands to take it a step further, because I think you're right. Sometimes it's like they need permission to raise your hand, but some kids, I think you'll agree, mm-hmm. they still won't raise their hand. Mm-hmm. So making it safe, whether it's, you know what, if you don't want to raise your hand now, come and see me after mm-hmm. class, or we've got the tutoring before before class, or on Tuesdays and Thursdays after school, or whatever it is, mm-hmm. I hear you saying, <laughs> let them know it's okay to ask questions. To ask questions, and it's okay to not get it the first time. Yeah. And let them know I'm here to help you. Mm-hmm. Awesome. What else? I think that it's very important to establish a sense of approachableness. I, I talked about how I felt Miss Beckley was very approachable. And I, I think I, at least at one point, talked about almost every single one of my favorite teachers had an element of approachableness, or I just felt comfortable with them. And I think that's part of why I feel like they were my favorite teachers, because I had more than just a academic relationship with them. I could t- actually talk with them. Mm-hmm. And they, th- uh, of course, the higher you get through um, education, you're closer to college. So teachers ask about your future after school. So with my high school teachers um, that stick out to me, they were the ones that genuinely wanted to know if I got into the schools that I applied to. Yep. The ones that wanted to know what I decided to study when I'm leaving. I had teachers ask like when I'm starting and things like that. So I think approachableness is really important because it also will open up doors to be able to have better discussions about whatever it is that maybe you're teaching, that they'll they'll feel that they can go and ask you extra questions or if they're interested in whatever the topic is, they can feel like they can ask you for more information or they could also go to you for more personal things, which are very important too. So I think approachableness is key because it will just bring more more memories in the long run, as you can see for me. You're building relationships. Yes. When you're approachable, students will, uh, if they feel like you care, uh-huh. they're going to come, they're going to talk to you. When you ask about how they're, it's one of those things like, it's okay to ask, hey, I heard you had a soccer game this weekend. How'd you do? Did mm-hmm. you win? Mm-hmm. Um, and actually pay attention, give them eye contact mm-hmm. when they <laughs> tell you about the game, not just a, Hey, how was your game? Okay, good, good, good. Let's move on. Yeah. But really ask a question and pay attention when they answer. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else? Yeah. One more thing. Yeah. To make classes as interactive as possible. And I mean that as in like when you're actually teaching, like I was saying, um, make, make questions possible so that there's actual discussions and it's not just students sitting and listening. And then taking notes or things like that, which sometimes that's totally yeah, are fine. You, are but... you saying that students don't like to sit <laughs> In a classroom and just have a teacher talk for 45 <laughs> minutes to an I hour am. straight. I, do you think other students feel the same way? I think so. I think so. What about adults? Do you think adults like I to think s- so. Yeah, I think we all, nobody likes to sit and listen. Again, sometimes it's net, but break it up. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to always be like that. And I also, like in that interactiveness, it it can be between the teacher and the students, but also... I believe that class discussions are really important so that it's student-student interaction Mm -hmm. because I think that not only does that make for better learning opportunities when students are talking to each other and seeing how um, the people around them are learning or seeing things, like if it's history class, how they're they're, understanding concepts or how they're seeing certain areas of history or whatever or how they're just translating the information in things like history class that have to do with people, like how the people around them understand the lessons. I think it also helps to build um, friendships in students and when they're actually able to talk with people around them. And I think that that is really great because sometimes kids go into classes without friends and all it takes is to just do a little bit of talking with the people around them through different, different projects, different whatever the assignment is and then they have a new friend they have someone they can talk to they have someone they've talked to before so the next time they go to class they feel like they can talk to them again even if it's about something different and I just think that when students are feeling good about talking to each other it helps the classroom environment because I've had I've had good and bad classroom environments where sometimes I just wasn't able to talk to the people around me and I had environments where I went in knowing nobody and then left knowing all the people around me because of 
great projects or just great conversations. Give it that opportunities would, to yeah, talk. Yeah, opportunities that the teachers gave to talk about things that soon branched into personal things. Like it may have started with just an assignment or like a get to know you thing at the beginning of the year, which I think things like that are sometimes things students grown at, like a go around and ask if this the, a person who has been to this state or whatever, yeah. like I've done a lot of those. But I think in the end it helps create that interactive feeling that then helps with the rest of the year. So Well, your brother, mm-hmm. Ben, my son, I mean <laughs> Just before we came up and started recording, he said that he made a couple friends Mm -hmm. in his ASL class today because there were opportunities to interact. And I think also for any teacher listening to that, it goes back to what you said earlier about that, making it safe to ask questions. That If you're a teacher at the elementary level, you you know, think, pair, share. When you ask a question or you give a prompt and you give students the opportunity to turn to a neighbor... Get with a partner and share what you think the answer is. That makes it safe. Because, Megan, if you're my partner and, and I'm asked by the teacher to think, pair, to share with a partner, I may not know the answer. Mm-hmm. But you do. You share something or you share something that prompts or uh, makes me, oh, makes me think of something. Now, when the teacher says, all right, who would like to share? Now, maybe I'm more comfortable mm-hmm. to share, but I wouldn't have been before. And like you said, it's a way to build friends and when kids are in school, they want to have friends. Mm-hmm. They want to have friends. So awesome. So real quickly to close, you mentioned one thing. <laughs> the last question was, so what is like the no-nos? Like what should a teacher, in your experience, it's like the 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 do not list. Now you mentioned like don't stand up every class period and talk. Never give kids the – that's a no-no. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. Anything else that, that – we're not mentioning names or anything like that, but just kind of an in general. Can you think of anything else that uh, – Yeah, like this is kind of a no-brainer, but don't negatively single out students in front of the whole class. Hmm. But I think that it would be a no-brainer to think that I'm not going to – I'm not going to tell Johnny over there that he did something bad in front of everybody. But I think that that sometimes the smallest things like – even a look that some students can catch that you're giving or the tone of your voice, which is sometimes hard to control, can be a form of singling out that you may not realize you're even doing or you do realize and you don't think it's as big of a deal as it is. I know that for any any person in any in, in situation, like tone of voice can sometimes be out of control. Like we aren't always aware that our tone of voice is hurting people as much as it is. Because I, I won't go into detail or mention anybody, but I have one I have one situation that still sticks out in my mind where I was singled out and I don't think the teacher meant to, but it stuck out in my mind. You still remember and it. You still I remember still it, though. I still remember it. And it's, it's okay if it happens, of course, but I think that it's just an awareness of attitude and tone of voice and making sure that if you do need to talk to somebody, then it, it does not happen in front of everybody because it can really... It can just really hurt someone's pride, sure. and it, it they'll remember it. Well, yeah. and yeah, I, I, and I think you said it's okay, not okay. I think it's we're gonna make mistakes, we're gonna get frustrated, stuff like that. But you're you're hitting on a for for adults listening, kids notice stuff like that. You said tone of voice, a look, mm-hmm. stuff like that. The the mm-hmm. size. Kids pick up on stuff like that. So you're thinking, what, I didn't do anything. Well, if you gave that little look, kids may be noticing. So great point. Anything else? Yeah, I think that sometimes people doubt if the way that they're explaining something is is helping anybody or if it's making any sense to any of one of the students sitting in the room. But I think that you shouldn't doubt that because somehow what you're saying is going to make sense to somebody and if it makes sense to one person but not the person sitting next to them then I think that's all right too because like I was saying about how making yourself approachable and then making it possible to ask questions I think that in a sense if a student doesn't understand something or the way you're explaining it if you have an environment where they are able to ask questions or be open to new, um, if you're open 
to new ways of teaching something or new routines because you listen to your students or you ask your students, is this working for you? Should we maybe read this at another time? Should we like do this a different way? And asking what works for the students since that's what your goal is after all. <laughs> so <laughs> don't shut them down. If you're open, yeah, don't shut them down and don't worry that the way that you're explaining something isn't working for somebody because I think that it is. I think that somehow what you're saying is reaching someone's ears and it's making sense and that they're hearing it correctly for them, the way that they learn. So, and I think that if you are open to, like if, you're, if your students feel like they can ask you questions and they don't understand the way you explained it, then it's going to be okay because they're going to ask you, okay, can you explain this again? Like, I just think that's So it's important. like those, those days as teachers, we all have the days where you're like, gosh, that... I didn't accomplish anything. I totally bombed. What I hear you saying is don't underestimate the impact that you're having. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter how badly your lesson went, kids are still getting something out of that and mm -hmm. taking it to the next level. What you're saying is if you've built that level of comfort and approachability for the kids who didn't necessarily get it, it's okay. Because they'll ask you about it. They'll ask you. For help. And, and what I'm hearing you say, ask them. Like, is there another way that, that, I mean, because I think we have to swallow our pride as teachers and be like, just, we have to get rid of the, well, I taught it, you didn't learn it. That, mm -hmm. if they didn't learn it, if the kids aren't learning, we can't call what we're doing teaching. Yeah, my senior year English class was a lot like that. It was actually a college class. It was a college level class taught on my high school campus, and it was very... It was called critical thinking and writing, so our professor was very open to asking us if the instructions for some assignments needed to be worded differently if we didn't understand what he was asking so we didn't go home and freak out about it. And most of the time, we were honest with him unless we didn't want to hurt his feelings or something like that. But he was open to asking us if we understood, and when we didn't, he was open to actually changing it. Oh, my gosh. And that right there, I think we can finish we'll close it right there is kudos to your to your teacher for Mr. Schultz. <laughs> Mr. Schultz. Thank you Mr. Schultz for for giving my daughter and the other students in that class the opera, for not being too proud to say I'm the teacher, I know what's best. You asked them. And for anyone listening, it's okay to say, does this make sense? And if it doesn't and they say mm, to be okay, let's let's fix it. That's what we ask of our students. That it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to have to refine what we do. We need to be able to practice what we preach, so to speak, as far as teaching. So, well, Megan, that was fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you it for thank you for taking the time to do that. And uh, so, this is again normally the 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 point of the sh of the broadcast where I would tell the teacher or the the leader, or whoever I, I'm, I'm talking with, sharing stories with. So, how could we find you on social media and all that good stuff? Um, well, where can, so where can we find you? Well, in a few days, we can find you down in San Diego at Point <laughs> yes. Loma and as, she, as you pursue your writing. And baby, I could not be more proud of you. I am so excited to see what you're going to do. And this is the point where it's like, if you choose, as you mentioned the writing, if you choose to pursue that writing, for anyone listening, I would say, in, in a few years, you'll be able to find her on Amazon because <laughs> if, if she chooses, there's no pressure. But if that's what you want to do, uh, you're that good, sweetheart. Thank you. You are that good. So uh, in a few years, just remember the name Megan Coley <laughs> because uh, she's going places, folks. So Megan, thank you, sweetie. I, I love, love you that. and I'm proud of you. And for everybody listening, uh, thank you. I appreciate you tuning in. And if you haven't already done so, remember you can subscribe. Uh, you can listen directly on brentcoley.com on the podcast page uh, or your favorite uh, podcast catcher, iTunes, Google Play. Uh, we're in Spotify as well, Stitcher. So be sure to subscribe and then new episodes will automatically be delivered to your computer or device. So Megan, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Everyone thank listening. You. Yeah. Everyone listening. Thank you. And until next time, have a good one.